important mm -hmm. important activity. Uh, so happy to have you again in our uh, Saudi um, uh, Critical Care Society uh, pediatric chapter. Um, today we are as well welcoming our um, colleagues from King Fahad Medical City. Uh, um, and we are appreciating their initiative. We are welcoming our external uh, guests, uh, Dr. Um, Kristen Carroll and Dr. Mark um, Ogainu. Uh, the mic now will be with the colleagues from King Fahad Medical City, Dr. Abdul Aziz al -Sakati and Dr. Sousan, uh, to take the lead in moderating this session. Please join us in this welcoming and stay with us uh, to refill um, the survey after uh, the session. Thanks so much, Dr. Aida, for this welcoming. Uh, this is Dr. Nadal Jassim speaking. Uh, good afternoon and good evening for everyone. Uh, I'm so lucky to have our uh, people uh, who are uh, really uh, accepted our invitation, thankfully, Prof. Ogino. Um, so, uh, 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 as well as Dr. Kristen uh, Carroll, who are inviting us uh, today from numerous uh, children's health. Um, Mark uh, has been the past president for Extracorporeal Life Support Organization from ELSO, and uh, he is also a professor in pedi uh, of pediatrics at Sydney University and the chief partner officer at Numerous Children's Health. And um, uh, I'm so excited that we have uh, Dr. Christine Carroll joining us as a medical director of critical care ECMO program and the clinical assistant professor of pediatrics uh, as well. Um, together with this, as Dr. Aida mentioned, uh, we have uh, our director from the Ministry of Health uh, and PIC Improvement Program, uh, as well as the chairman of the pediatric critical care uh, at the second healthcare cluster and King Fahd Medical City, Dr. Abdelaziz al Sakati. Uh, he's going to moderate this session together with our senior uh, consultant, uh, uh, Dr. Sosan Al Yusuf, uh, who is uh, intensivist and assistant professor at uh, Noura University. Uh, I really thank everyone for uh, attending today, and uh, I'm sure we're going to have a wonderful night shedding lights on uh, respiratory ECMO in pediatrics a little bit on a neonatal, and we're gonna focus on VV ECMO uh, uh, mainly. Dr. Sousan, tfaddali. Assalamu alaikum, Jamian. Uh, thank you for attending uh, uh, this uh, uh, conference, uh, and I hope everyone will enjoy it and have uh, a good uh, time. Okay, let us start with our uh, first speaker, uh, Dr. Mustafa Wajay Safi. Dr. Mustafa is a pediatric cardiac and general ICU consultant, had his uh, PIC fellowship at KFMC, then he had further trained in Montreal Children's Hospital mm -hmm. and subspecialized in cardiac ICU at Sick Kids Hospital. He is currently uh, the PICU fellowship program director and the co-chair uh, of uh, pediatric uh, ECMO team at uh, KFMC. So welcome, Dr. Mustafa. We're gonna hear uh, about uh, talking about VV ex uh, ECMO uh, section criteria, selection criteria. Welcome, Dr. Mustafa. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Sousan, for uh, the introduction. Thank you everybody for attending and thank you for uh, allow giving me the chance uh, to have this short presentation about uh, a more uh, complicated topic, which is the selection criteria and respiratory ECMO. I have no disclosure, and my objective is uh, for uh, the lectures to highlight some of the outcomes, talk about the indications, contraindications, uh, respiratory ECMO in certain cases. It's very clear that over the world uh, and over the last years that the number of ECMO runs and the number of ECMO centers is growing over the uh, uh, areas and over all the worlds, and uh, it's very clear. Uh, but at the same time, we have uh, less ECMO neonatal runs or less respiratory ECMO neonatal runs compared with increasing uh, our pediatric uh, neonatal runs. So I think the, incre the increment in overall is reflecting the pediatric uh, more than the neonatal uh, VV ECMO. 
and uh, what is uh, the overall outcome. So despite uh, increasing the acuity of the disease and the complexity, uh, still we have almost the same uh, outcome with no much changes over the last 10 years. And that might be explained by advanced technology, improved experience and refined management strategies. So if we look for the pediatric, we have survival in respiratory of 61. We have in the, uh, for sure for the neonatal, they have a better outcome most likely affected by the meconium aspiration syndrome, uh, which is 72% survival to discharge. Uh, here it's a clear over the last 10 years in the neonatal ECMO, there's no uh, significant change in the survival. Uh, and also uh, the same things in the pediatric uh, VV ECMO or respiratory ECMO. And the question here, are we going doing good or bad or unknown uh, intervention for our patient? The, answer, the question is answered with a randomized controlled trial in neonate and the conclusion that the ECMO or respiratory ECMO reduced morbidity and mortality in infant who received ECLS compared to the conventional therapy. But still, we don't have the answer in pediatric. So we have uh, an, uh, like no randomized controlled trial in children beyond the neonatal period, but clinical trials in neonate and adults can be uh, encouraging to use the ECMO in acute respiratory failure in pediatric. So we are depending basically in pediatric on published studies, which is basically case report, case series, single retrospective uh, studies and the expert experience and institutional experience rather than high quality or level one uh, evidence. Before we think to start ECMO, we have to know the characteristics of, e of ECLS or ECMO as modality. So it's a supportive, not curative treatment, and this is a very important concept, and it's a temporary, not a destination. So you are putting your ECMO planning to do something else by the end. Only you are allowing to uh, organ uh, recovery and allowing the treatment to happen until the patient either recover or you have a different decision. Uh, your ECMO can be partial or total, can be cardiac, can be respiratory, can be full support, can be partial, partial support. And uh, the may, main aim of ECMO is to avoid iatrogenic organ injury and that by avoiding uh, uh, like harmful uh, ventilatory setting while we are supporting with ECMO. To have successful ECMO, you have three basic uh, uh, essentials. The first one, which is um, basically the topic for today or for my presentation, which is selection of the right patient at the right time. And most of the time, it's a freak, it's a complex. It's not as easy as we think. So uh, improving the medical therapies, advances, uh, making the candidacy more fluid and more patient now are candidate for ECMO and with a less contraindication. And that's why still it's a team-based decision with ECMO intensivist is crucial and patient characteristics will be assessed on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, and the other essential for ECMO is uh, that we are reducing the risk of ventilator-induced uh, lung injury and we are reducing the progression for the multi-organ failure. So how to select? No widely validated tools exist in ECMO inclusion for ECMO inclusion exclusion criteria, unfortunately, in the neonatal and pediatric acute respiratory failure. But we have to think uh, to, to use the best available evidence, use the ELSO ECMO guidelines, which are really very helpful and based on the expert opinion, look for the international experiences, adding to that your center experience and this like very frequently will be affected with ECMO logistics, team credentialing and training and personal availability and the quality assurance and benchmarking. The principle is the same. So the main principle guiding your selection are two, known or suspected reversible pathology, which can be treated with while providing ECMO and the risk of less invasive support are considered more than the risk of ECMO. So ECMO is not an automated pathway. And to be really specific in your selection, there is a set of questions. Whenever you think there is a patient of ECMO, you have to answer these questions to be able to reach by the end to a proper selection for your patient. So the first question, which is the easiest question to answer, is it 
respiratory failure or cardiac or both? And if it is respiratory, is it hypoxic, hypercapnic, or a combination of both? The second question, which is more difficult, is the diagnosis reversible? So we are digging deeper here in the indication. And is it reversible within a good time or uh, with a long-term survival acceptable? This is the crucial for successful patient selection. And I think it's one of the more challenging questions to, to judge. And based on the outcomes of a different disease, the disease can be categorized in uh, diseases with a favorable outcome, high risk and unfavorable outcome. If the process is not reversible, then the other question, is he a transplant candidate? And in exceptional cases, that even if he is not a transplant candidate, the patient can't be bridged to decision. Then you have to ask yourself, how acute is your deterioration and what's the severity of the disease? So, uh, and this uh, question also uh, a very difficult to answer question and the answer for this question is changing with the time and that because there is advances in the treatment modality. So what's applicable 10 years ago, it's totally different from now. The, the, the management strategy is keeping the changes and that's why the severity uh, uh, for decision can be uh, affected. Always select the sickest patient. And think about the ECMO when you have a mortality of about 50% and you have to do it if you reach to 80%, no way. But how to predict? Unfortunately, there's no validated tools to predict the need for VV ECMO. And uh, simply, simply, many, they are using the failure to respond to other therapy as indication for ECLS. But still, there are some metrics that at least the evidence and the consensus and the experts, they recommend to use it. And one of the important is the oxygenation index, which is more commonly the, the main indicators in hypoxic failure in neonate. The second metrics is the PF ratio and the PF ratio of less than 80 uh, usually is an indication for ECMO, but some centers are some uh, are recommending uh, less than 60 to 80. Hypercapnic respiratory failure with a pH of 7 to 7.25 and progressive barotrauma as a result of mechanical ventilation. A lot of the pre predictor score tried and until now there is no well validated, at least in pediatric. There's many scores that are tried in the neonate to predict the need for ECMO, but basically they are predicting more the mortality other than the need for ECMO. Uh, because they are only studied on ECMO patient. Uh, again, in pediatric, there's many uh, outcome scores. And the, until now, unfortunately, there is no tool to tell you, okay, these are the uh, prediction score. And if it is like this, go ahead and do ECMO. A uh, newly uh, developed score that is not yet developed. And this is uh, the only score available for pediatric that can uh, predict the need of VV ECMO, but uh, until now there is no good validation for it, so it's not yet recommended for use. And then you have to ask yourself, when I will continue conventional and when I will move to ECMO? And when the general word say refractory to maximum standard therapy, what is the refractory to maximum? What is the maximum? Do we have a clear definition for the maximum? Unfortunately, no. And here is the challenge to starting the time or the time of starting or initiation of the VV ECMO. Uh, are we going to wait until the patient is dying and going for ECMO or we have to go early intervention? And there is argument in both sides. And uh, here is the, the challenge between the, in the timely intervention and at the same, same time, we should neg not neglect evidence-based uh, a medical intervention. So you have to balance things. Uh, the, the very clear that the early initiation of ECMO before development for, by the evidence of, uh, uh, and the evidence uh, uh, before the uh, multi-organ failure can improve outcome. And uh, you should uh, consider the candidacy early in the illness and deciding the timing uh, can be difficult to define. But we need objectives, and unfortunately, we don't have a well-defined objectives. 
but there is some parameters which, as we mentioned, the oxygenation index, the degree of lactic acidosis, the extent of hypoxemia and ventilator pressures can guide your decision. Additional clinical and logistic factors, which is the rate of lung deterioration, the onset of secondary organ failure, the near of the inter-hospital patient transport, all of these will play a role in your time of intervention or time of decision of ECMO. Okay, you have decided, you have to make sure that you have no contraindication. And what are in general the groups of contraindication when you have no chance, that means this is irreversible disease or no purpose, and the quality of life will be poor or not, uh, not, uh, not uh, a good quality of life after recovery. And when I'm unable, and that unable might be due to the patient factors and sometimes might be to the uh, logistic or uh, even uh, center factors. Answer all the previous questions, then we'll, you will be confident to answer this question. What's my purpose now? Is it for recovery or transplant, diagnosis, palliation, until I decide or to bridge to uh, bridging uh, for the bridge like VAD in cardiac cases or, or bridge to organ donation, which is a rare uh, indication. Before we go ahead and implement ECMO, I have to take the consent with making sure the competency of decision maker, a clear understanding with benefit risk and adequate disclosure of information and acceptance and lack of coercion. And here, there is a conflict between the hope versus science and always the family, they will look, this is a golden uh, modality that just keeping the life on. And here's the difficulty uh, of taking the consent and deciding uh, about implementing the modality. Uh, some few highlights uh, on uh, more specific on neonatal ECMO. So it's a clear the, uh, there is a different type of or indication of diseases. Uh, the, the most common is the others and that reflecting a more variety of indications. So more disease process that indicated or implemented as indication for ECMO. Uh, the, uh, the congenital diaphragmatic hernia is more than the uh, um, uh, meconium aspiration syndrome. Uh, but, and the outcome is the best in meconium aspiration, least in the sepsis and congenital uh, diaphragmatic hernia. And the acceptable metrics to use it or to, uh, to implement ECMO neonate is sustained elevation of oxygenation index, more than 40 for like, this is uh, straightforward, and more than 25 if more than 24 hours if you have signs of inadequate tissue oxygenation and severe hypoxic failure with a PO2 less than 40 and severe pulmonary hypertension with evidence of ventricular failure. These are the uh, so far the best uh, recommended metrics from the evidence and from the guidelines. Uh, what are the contraindication in neonate? We have the lethal chromosomal uh, disorder, severe re reversible brain damage, and again, uh, to define it sometimes is difficult and uncontrollable bleeding, significant IV uh, intraventricular hemorrhage, grade three or four, weight less than 1.5, and gestational age of less than uh, 30. A relative contraindication less than 34 and less than two kilogram. And here how I think or how I implement. So I have a neonate with severe respiratory distress with a likelihood of mortality high, potentially reversible. I have more than one, one or more of the uh, metrics that uh, we mentioned. Uh, I don't have the contraindication and then I go for it. What about pediatric? Again, the other is the main group for pediatric that again, uh, uh, reflecting the diversity of the indication. So almost we are providing ECMO for most of the disease or respiratory disease nowadays, the outcome uh, based in uh, aspiration pneumonia and uh, uh, ARDS uh, post trauma and uh, viral and bacterial pneumonia. And here's the list of indications and again, uh, almost we are doing ECMO for most of the indication if we have the metrics that uh, uh, justifying the severity. So, and we have the reversibility. So multiple airway diseases, multiple lung diseases, a list is long to do uh, to indicate the VB ECMO. Uh, nowadays we have also, even in more complex diseases, we are uh, having a report about ECMO with a survival of 60% and severe pulmonary hemorrhage 
in a malignancy cases, 40 to 50 percent in uh, HLH of 35 to 45, and also uh, can be implemented in a burn, in smoke, injury, and what are uh, the uh, major metrics that used in pediatric, which is different in, from the neonate, uh, either severe oxygenation failure with a PEF ratio in pediatric more used than the neonate less than 60 to 80, that uh, having 80% mortality, oxygenation index of more than 40 and lack of response to conventional therapy, elevated pressure in the ventilation, uh, pH of less than seven uh, with a CO2 of more than 90. And uh, we have the diseases that having a poor, prog uh, worse prognosis, those with pertussis, fungal immune deficiency, hepatic or renal, uh, uh, status asthmatic is one of the indication with a great survival, and there is established um, a suggested criteria for the initiation of BV ECMO and status asthmaticus. In the ARDS, uh, the, the recommendation, uh, either the PALIC2 recommendation or the ELSO recommendation is still a uh, kind of general and uh, a lot of decision being left for the physician or for the center to decide to implement our ECMO. So in general, the outcome uh, now in the studies showing uh, like the outcome is uh, worse when you have oxygenation index more than 16 to 20, but still the general recommendation or the general use uh, of the uh, ECMO when you have your oxygenation index more than uh, 40, but definitely when your oxygenation index is more than 16 to 20, please refer to the ECMO center. Don't wait more. This is the time. Um, specific patient bridge to transplant, few cases in pediatric, initial report being not good outcome, the late report showing comparable outcome with other indication. In the COVID, we have a very scarce report in pediatric because uh, mainly the patient when he is sick from COVID present with MSC and with hemodynamics and most commonly he will go for VA ECMO and hopefully we will not get more report even. So the pandemic is out and hopefully we'll not get back for it. The trauma, a lot of indication trauma for VB ECMO and uh, it's well known and with a good outcome in uh, trauma patients. Sepsis is not a contraindication for ECMO. The vasoplegic shock is the contraindication for respiratory ECMO, but sepsis per, per alone is not a contraindication. And uh, these are the general uh, contraindication list for pediatric patient with severe neurological impairment, uh, cardiac arrest with no good uh, adequate CPR, pulmonary hypertension, uh, multi-organ dysfunction, incurable malignancy. Uh, and this is the best available uh, in the literature. Uh, and the question about the uh, mechanical ventilator days and is it contraindication and how many days, uh, seven or 14, the early report showing that more seven having worse outcome than uh, less than seven, but the recent report showing uh, like comparable outcome if you have mechanical ventilation less than 14. And uh, recently, uh, the total duration of ventilation before ECMO might not really predict survival in the setting of uh, the uh, uh, lung protective strategy. And that's why uh, it's not a, a, a contraindication of ECMO. The multi-organ failure, it's well known. Uh, try to implement your ECMO before you have the organ failure. And sometimes VB ECMO can help you when hypoxia is the cause for hemodynamic failure. So uh, it's well known that when you have uh, other organ failure, the outcome will be uh, less uh, favorable than when you don't have uh, the comorbidities, including renal, uh, lung, chronic, liver, uh, congenital heart disease, cardiomyopathy, uh, cancer, primary immune deficiency, the presence of all of these affecting the survival and dropping your uh, survival significantly uh, on ECMO. And the dilemma continue. Why it's continue? Because we have we are deciding the life and uh, in the life and death circumstances, and we have to decide in a very short time frame. And at the same time, we have expanding clinical indications with a less contraindication, making things changing over time. And long-term outcome are not fully understood. Quality of life is also an important factor. And defining the quality of life on, or what is the acceptable quality of life is not the same for everybody. So take home messages. 
no validated tools until now exist for ECMO inclusion or exclusion criteria for neonatal or pediatric patient with acute respiratory failure. The most important is the presence of reversible disease process. Further specific uh, criteria for ECMO are institution specific and highly variable. Most candidacy decisions are made through multidisciplinary discussion. Early initiation of ECMO before development of multi-organ failure and ventilator-induced lung injury may improve the outcome. And the best we can do is to do what we believe in what uh, uh, in and be honest with ourselves and others. And this uh, how I, I, I think about decision of ECMO. So look for the patient factors, look for the diagnosis and the clinical status of the patient, look for the guidelines and the expert opinion, look for your center factors and then decide in ECMO. Um, and we have established in KFMC a criteria that we are keeping updated based on the best available evidence and based on resources and uh, the uh, uh, available logistics. And um, uh, thank you. Amazing talk, Dr. Mustafa. Thanks so much for uh, your uh, presence today. And without any further delay, uh, I would excuse myself uh, uh, to ask uh, for allowing share. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Mustafa, uh, your great talk. And uh, as usual, I'm happy to be part of this uh, talk today. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce my colleagues, uh, Dr. Nadal Jassim. Uh, she is the head of uh, pediatric cardiovascular ICU at Kif Kinkrad Medical City. And she is the head of ECMO uh, service in Kinkrad Medical City, as well she is the service line lead in Riyadh Cluster 2 for ECMO. Uh, she is going to talk today about respiratory care and VB ECMO. Uh, my is for you, Dr. Nadal. Thanks so much, Dr. Abdelaziz. Are, are my slides up? Yes. Perfect. Okay, so uh, my talk today is about uh, respiratory care on VV ECMO, uh, knowing that uh, the patient fit on the criteria and now the new challenge is to manage him. I have no disclosure. The outlines will be a brief overview to be able to understand what are the proper mechanical ventilation on VV ECMO, highlights on respiratory care on VV ECMO like proning, pulmonary hygiene and others, then Hypoxemia, hypoxemia on VV ECMO, why it's happening. So as mentioned briefly by my colleague, ECMO would support lungs and heart. Our focus today is talking about VV ECMO that is primarily supporting the lungs in refractory respiratory failure. It has no direct cardiac support, but improving oxygenation could support all the organs, including the hemodynamics, and also relax the pulmonary vascular bed in context of having some pulmonary hypertension in those patients. So on VV ECMO, the main function will be oxygenation and carbon dioxide washing. And this is would be achieved by connecting oxygen and air gas to the oxygenator, where this process is gonna go very complex. It has multiple factors that would affect the uh, or determine the degree of oxygenation and carbon dioxide wash out, such as blood flow rate and the surface area of the oxygenator, as well as the total cardiac output of the patient and hemoglobin levels as well. Hypercarbia is diffused much easier and faster, and that's why we need to be careful once ECMO is implemented on the patient to titrate the air, which is what we call it sweep gas flow that is connected through this green port very slowly. The usual ratio is 0.5 to 1, 0.5 of air corresponding to one cardiac, uh, cardiac output uh, that is provided through the ECMO. And this is might be just as minimal as it need to be and up to 2 to 1 ratio. The perfusion is always at bedside to help out. However, it's very much noted that the oxygen saturation that we do accept on VV ECMO is not more than 92%.
and it is sometimes 80 or 85 percent then people will start to ask why then why i did put this patient on ecmo rather than continuing the mechanical ventilator so this is because the oxygenated blood will return from the ECMO circuit to the right atrium where deoxygenated blood will just come through other uh, uh, sources like coronary sinus and the systemic veins like in the IVC or SVC depend where is your return ECMO cannula and gonna be mixed up. So the overall saturation that's gonna be landed is 75 to 85%, which is acceptable in most of the time. And what's really important is to watch for oxygen delivery and oxygen extraction, decreasing the demand of the patient as well as the SVR of the patient. It's much more complex than the normal physiology using lungs and the, na than the native lungs and the heart itself. And that's because there are multiple factors as we just mentioned, having the cardiac output of the patient mixed in, mi mixing up, having uh, unventilated or very sick lungs with dead space, plus having shunting physiology, depending on this all, the, parties, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the whole factors, it would just determine how much the patient will land as oxygen saturation. So why we implemented ECMO then? It's not because the oxygen saturation goals itself or the degree of the gas exchange that we would love to have it as a number, but also to rest the lungs. So it's very important to consider the ventilator induced lung injury and very severe refractory respiratory failure that we would use many maneuvers and including the aggressive recruitment or higher settings that could damage the lung further and allow for higher mortality and morbidities. So what are the, uh, the proper mechanical ventilation settings that we would consider on VV ECMO? There are no concrete or, uh, uh, or statements for the proper mechanical ventilatory settings. However, the usually, uh, usually those patients with severe ARDS pathophysiology would be already tried with the recommendations of the parts uh, for protective lung strategy. This is not always right when we uh, consider other pathologies or patients who had respiratory failure due to other diseases. But we say that most of the time, patients will be already on protective lung strategy before going to ECMO. And we would love that those patients had been considered early for protecting their lungs from damage. And most of those recommendations, uh, uh, if being applied, uh, we will have better survival benefits. However, when we combine the mechanical ventilatory settings and the ECMO, we will have more challenging to uh, more challenge to decide about the proper settings as it's not well defined, as I mentioned. So the overall aim is to limit the alveolar strain and atelectasis at this stage, rely on the ECMO to do the gas exchange and rest the lungs. Maintain adequate PEEP to not have atelectasis. At the same time, not to overdo things by titrating the lung uh, for recruitment to allow better secretion clearance and also reduce the intensity and the mechanical power by avoiding high airway pressures and driving pressures as we just do in severe ARDS. When we come to PEEP titration, and when we come into lung recruitments, and when we come to airway pressures, there are many, many variations has been happening. So that's why I went, we went to through the literature and an international survey, it showed that majority of PEEP uh, that is being used on ECMO has been between six to 10 in both pediatrics and adults, however, higher PEEP could be tried, and it's been tried actually, especially in adults more in neonatal and pediatrics. Together, this is will happen together with using low tidal volumes, perhaps minimal tidal volumes, and the other protective pressures that we will go over it. So why ECMO? Again, 
in adult literature based on two major trials uh, that has been uh, done earlier in 2019 uh, in 2009 caesar trial in adults which is comparing the conventional ventilation uh, versus the ecmo with the settings of ARDS have shown that the mortality is much less with the ECMO group. And this is again replicated when they uh, go through ECMO to rescue the lung injury in severe ARDS in 2018. So the comparison between the two is all going through, resting the lungs. And the pressures are comparable between PEEP of 10, perhaps higher, but with titration as I mentioned, lower rate in Caesar than AOLA trial and low FiO2 less than 60%, generally speaking. And this is what's compared uh, to the best available evidence on the ventilator, which is APRV. And the target plateau pr uh, pressure was generally less than 25. And if we talk about driving a pressure, that, it, that is too. Considering driving a pressure that would do less harm than before going through less than 15 will be very helpful in uh, protecting the lung and uh, preventing further damage so that's why these are today the most of the recommendations of the mechanical ventilator settings when going over vv ECMO. this is in adults and the same applied for pediatrics as per the latest also guidelines that we have today for pediatrics. Going through FiO2 less than 0.5, going through peak inspiratory pressure less than 25, and going through PEEP anywhere between 5 to 15, and going through respiratory rate between 10 to 20, with inspiratory time between 0.8 to 1 seconds, depending on the patient's age and size. Is it all? We will follow up numbers. Of course, not to follow up only numbers. We need to personalize to the patient size as well as the disease path of physiology. You perhaps have patients who have more pockets of air, more pneumothoraces. Other patients would have more stiff lungs. You would have patients with status asthmaticus who are very, very meticulous about air trapping, and others are not. So. Going through this lungs, I wouldn't say that we will go for higher PEEP aiming for recruitment of the basal lungs. In fact, you may consider much lower PEEP or even having uh, zero pressures. All of that variation is subjected for changes depending on the risks and benefits. Is it tried? Yes, perhaps it worked in patients and others who are not. What about high frequency oscillator ventilator on pediatric VV ECMO? Question would come through. And perhaps this question will come through if we don't have efficient gas exchange that we expected upon connecting the patient to the ECMO. So we will go through this exercise uh, by the end of, the, uh, of this talk. But this is a question that remains unanswered. Now, few highlights on respiratory care on VV ECMO. Lung recruitment. Different practices has been used, whether it's manual or via gentle ventilator recruitments. People would call it gentle or aggressive. I don't know what to call it. At the end, it is lungs recruitment that is being done to very sick lungs. Should it be beneficial? Should it be recommended? I will leave this for Brav Ogino. The pulmonary hygiene and bronchoscopy is another, some, uh, is another procedure that's being done for, uh, as a part of care uh, during ECMO, sometimes for diagnostic purposes and others for airway clearance and trying to open up the, uh, the lung in preparation for weaning the patient from ECMO. This is a patient that we had a hard time to wean him from ECMO done multiple bronchoscopies and showed very bad and badly infected airways together with the procedure of airway clearance. In one of the surveys that I have shared earlier, the bronchoscopy have been showed that is used frequently for clearing the secretions and perhaps to evaluate the infections uh, as it's done in our case 
and also to evaluate the anatomy or the lung disease, uh, ruling out pulmonary hemorrhage or opening up atelectasis. What about extubation on ECMO? People feel enthusiastic to try new things and new toys in our ICUs. Extubation on ECMO is really variable across uh, uh, multiple surveys in adult. In pediatrics is much less. 27% of pediatrics has been tried to do the extubations. 14% of them have been tried it in the first week of support. Once the program is confident that the, uh, the, uh, the team will be able to handle extubated patients on ECMO could be considered. But again, this variation is subjected for patient to patient and to the pathophysiology and the sickness of the lungs. So in pediatric case series that was done in single center experience, many of the patients has been tried to, uh, to be extubated and those patients were variable uh, during the disease process. All what we know today is some patients would be very tachypneic, sorry, some patients would be very tachypneic if you do it earlier and they are not ready and extubation allowing patient to, uh, to uh, breathe spontaneously would uh, also cause inflict uh, or, uh, would cause uh, injuries to the alveoli. In fact, patients who are in need for prolonged, uh, prolonged ECMO or as a, a bridged for transplantation would be of more benefit to this type of practice. What about a tracheostomy on ECMO? Tracheostomy on ECMO was also tried on uh, patients uh, who are um, uh, between adults and pediatrics. And this procedure could be done either by cut down or uh, um, uh, uh, perk tenuously and the, uh, the end results of it is having some bleeding or infection. So the risk is there. However, the benefit of having patients who are able to wake up less bounded to the beds and less sedated or paralyzed is there. Again, tracheostomy is usually considered in a prolonged ventilatory run, perhaps earlier in um, adults than in children as we used to delay it even for patients who in need for chronic uh, ventilator. I, I shed a little bit of light on spontaneous breathing when I mentioned the extubation. However, some patients after extubation would, would be in need for some oxygen, others would need some non-invasive support or high flow nasal cannula. Prone positioning on ECMO is another respiratory uh, uh, support that we uh, often consider for patients on ECMO. And this is, could be for multiple reasons. So prone positioning in ARDS itself was approved to have benefit. In fact, there is no excuse to, to do ECMO without a trial of a proning on adults. This evidence could not, uh, uh, could not be elicited in pediatrics and the benefits was not uh, the benefits versus risk was not as high as make people enthusiastic to try it. However, few cases being tried and the, uh, at the end weighing risk and benefit is the key here. So doing the proning on ECMO make the story even more complex because is this going to go on because the patient is hypoxemic? What if the hypoxemia happening not because of basal atelectasis or de-recruitment, what about considering having the proning on RV failing patients? We, ha we have to remember that, I mean, we should remember that the prone positioning in severe ARDS despite did not show improvement. It was showing improvement in unloading the right ventricle, especially on patients who are uh, having uh, element of pulmonary hypertension. And it does improve oxygenation without increasing the PEEP and it does decrease the hypercarbia as well. So having this mechanism could help the oxygenation in one way or another. Should it be tried? Should it be a standard of practice? No, not yet. This is one of our children after 
ruling out all the possibilities of hypoxemia. He was having borderline saturations uh, at one point where proning was considered. In another occasion, and after having two months of ECMO, the, the child was un was uh, having still challenge in the gas exchange and we were unable to wean him. So proning was considered. By that time, there was a real um, or there was a, a confirmed pulmonary hypertension and RV strain uh, that is compromising the gas exchange as well. So we thought of unloading the RV mechanism. The last few highlights on hypoxemia on VV ECMO. The saturation is low, ECMO is going very well, and we are aiming for good hemoglobin, oxygen delivery is good, lactate is good. However, I'm not happy about the numbers. I could tolerate 75, and I could not tolerate 71%. What are the possible causes? Hypoxemia on VV ECMO, again, is very complex. Going through the simple rule, increase the metabolic demand and uh, 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 is uh, a reason that you should aim for decreasing the consumption and utilization to improve the saturation. So there should be no place for doubts about sepsis, fever, shivering, agitation, or high cardiac output state to say this patient hypoxia hypoxemic because of these events. However, it is challenging when it is because of the ECMO itself. Reasons related to the ECMO could be due to recirculation, drainage insufficiency, or oxygenator that is failing. The recirculation is one of the common problems uh, with the challenges, uh, and it needs to be tackled through managing the ECMO itself, which we will be able to uh, hopefully arrange for workshops that is a practical to go over this stuff. Many pathways has been published in adults. I found them very helpful in pediatrics, considering the stepwise approach, not to rush for increasing the flow or increasing the FiO2 or relying on mechanical ventilatory or even use the emergency setting of mechanical ventilator that we usually post at bedside. And as you see on this uh, screen, which is going again through hammering the lung with 100% oxygen, higher rate and higher PIB and back to square zero. The take home messages here, failing to decrease ventilatory settings once on ECMO is obviously major potential, uh, uh, potential uh, risk for the patient and would obviate the, the benefit of the ECMO itself. The second, avoid uh, overreacting to the low saturations and increasing the ventilatory settings for compensation. The balance between oxygen delivery and oxygen demand is very crucial as it's always. Third, many respiratory care maneuvers and procedures has been tried without clear evidence in children, the importance weighing risk and benefit. Last, management of VV ECMO is very complex, perhaps more complex than VA ECMO. At the end, the best highlight from my talk today is finding the fine balance between conventional mechanical ventilatory support with all of the ventilator-induced injury that could uh, result from it, and the ECLS with all the complication and the decision-making that was explained by my colleagues with the risk of life and death in both of them, we should have the fine balance weighing mortality that is perhaps higher with conventional support if we don't go on ECMO. Thanks so much. Questions and answers? Assalamu uh, alaikum warahmatullah. Uh, thank you very much for the nice presentation. Uh, I have um, a question to the panel um, about um, 
the hypercarbic um, respiratory failure um, and indications for CO2 removal device um, as uh, a, a arteriovenous um, um, uh, extracorporeal uh, device, uh, nova lung or um, um, yeah, uh, sort of um, uh, an oxygenator uh, connected uh, from an artery to a vein. Um, how does that uh, play a role in, in your experience in pediatrics? Can you uh, collaborate on your experience in pediatrics with this um, type of uh, management? I'm so sorry, would you please rephrase your question? And Ms. Rose, if you can unmute Dr. Sosan and Dr. Abdelaziz, please. Would you please rephrase your question, sorry. Ms. Rose, can, would you please uh, unmute the moderators? Yes, they are un unmuted, yeah. Dr. Thank you, Dr. Linda, for your uh, great presentation. Uh, I think maybe there's technical issue for unmute uh, the candidate here. Uh, I don't know if you can repeat the question, uh, Dr. So you can ask, you just ask it. Yes, uh, I would ask Prof. Ogino if you have the question clearly because yeah. Okay. So, uh, I have a question uh, for you, uh, Doctor. Uh, then we uh, solve these technical issues. Uh, it's great uh, presentation, but one of the question almost come to the uh, the intensivist. Where do we can do the recruitment uh, maneuver to the lungs of the patient in uh, respiratory? And if that uh, the case, if there's any difference between recruitment in the unit versus uh, children? Is my question clear, Doctora? Nara, do you want me to answer that? Yeah, please go ahead. Chris, Chris can you unmute Kristen uh, uh, Carol too? Um, just so that uh, we can join. So the first question I, I think I, I understood uh, was for the hypercarbic uh, respiratory failure. Your question probably was uh, directed toward the use of ECOR, um, extracorporeal CO2 removal, uh, right? Using um, using the Nova Long uh, low membrane or any type of low resistance membrane where you uh, cannulate the artery and just have uh, the, in the native cardiac output push the blood through the uh, oxygenator and then return it through the venous side and have some sweep there. And you're not really oxygenating. All you're doing is uh, is removing the CO2. I, I think that was your question on ECOR. Um, is that, uh, so I'm gonna assume that's correct. So uh, Kristen could probably add this, but uh, ECOR, you know, um, ECOR, uh, use use in pediatrics really has not been uh, has not been uh, uh, embraced or adapted. I think what has happened is that there was a few studies very early on by Gattioni that showed that you know in adults ECOR was potentially uh, a a not a substitute but a, a, a something that was uh, was a, a additive to ventilatory support to reduce settings, um, uh, vent, uh, vent settings so that um, you could reduce, you could ventilate using um, using the mechanical ventilation, but also using the, the extra, uh, using the uh, oxygenator uh, only as for CO2 removal. But subsequent studies uh, looking at ECOR really hasn't shown any benefit for just using uh, ECOR as a supplement to uh, uh, additive or a supplement to mechanical ventilation. Um, but uh, as far as uh, I know, um, there probably has been some use, but in the United States, it, it's, uh, it has not been adapted. And I actually don't even think it is, uh, it would be off-label use. Uh, so uh, uh, for your question, using uh, ECOR just for, let's just say asthma, uh, it has not been adapted. It's it's been 
uh, ECMO. Um, Kristen, do you have anything else? Yeah, thanks, Mark. Um, Kristen Carroll here. I completely agree with all that you've said so far. And as the person who'll be talking about challenges of ECMO in the next session, um, ECOR in pediatric patients has some unique challenges, not the least of which is the small vascular size for many children that make it difficult to uh, safely cannulate them with low enough resistance to utilize the native circulation. And in addition to that, we have our children who are more difficult to sedate and any amount of movement, change in intrathoracic pressure, et cetera, will, have, will increase the afterload on an e-core circuit uh, because you are using native cardiac output and reduce flow overall. So two additional reasons that it's not been adopted in pediatric patients. Um, not a, it, it, does anybody have any questions on that? Because then I, I can attempt to answer the second question. Well, we would love to have your answer for that. Well, I don't have an answer, but I could discuss <laughs> this with Kristen because the recruitment uh, is a major issue. And you know what? I talk too much, so I'm going to let Kristen go first. <laughs> Thanks, Mark. Um, so in, in general, um, our practice in the US, and I think the, the practice that's endorsed by ELSO is to not formally recruit the lungs um, throughout the ECMO course. And that's true for both neonates and pediatric patients. The goal is to have the patient on a lung rest strategy. And as their native lung function improves, the lungs heal you will see increasing tidal volume on the ventilator at some set pressures. Many, many uh, institutions use a peak inspiratory pressure of 20 and a peep of 10, but that's just a guideline. So as the native lung improves, you'll see increasing tidal volume. And that's typically preceded by uh, visualized air on the chest x-rays as the lungs improve. Once you're in that phase of recovery, which could be a variable number of days from the initial insult of the injury. Um, that is when you may choose to change your ventilator settings from a pressure control mode to a volume mode or a pressure regulated volume control and allow a little bit more pressure onto the lungs. The goal should still be to maintain uh, ventil safe ventilation strategies with a driving pressure less than 15 or 16, depending on which papers you read and a peak inspiratory pressure always less than 28. Um, but again, early in the course and even through the mid course, there should be no um, pressure placed on the lungs intentionally so that they can continue to allow to, to heal. So um, if I can add a couple of things, so completely agree with uh, Dr. Carroll, and that is really the ELSO stance on lung recruitment. But I think the uh, piece that we should all remember is that the use of long-term VV ECMO has generated <laughs> yeah. uh, has generated uh, a, a new area, right? So before there was always uh, doubt that there was lung gene regeneration, but now with some of these adult cases and, and also pediatric cases that have been on VV ECMO for months and we see uh, 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 recruitment, self-recruitment and uh, eventual healing of a completely consolidated lung, the, the topic of lung regeneration has occurred. The, the problem though, is that this is sort of something that has been observed over the last, I would say half a, half a, half a decade or five years. We don't really know the timing, nor do we know which patients will actually recover with lung regeneration. So that's, that's the biggest piece. Now, if you start to recruit on a lung that potentially we is going through a healing process and regenerating tissue, and you try to recruit and add uh, distending pressure, airway pressure, or whatever type of injury, you may actually stop that regeneration and injure the lung further. So the question on when to recruit 
is not uh, is is the safest answer is what uh, I think uh, is what Dr. Carroll said. When you see evidence of aeration occurring with spont with low pressures or with self uh, with self recruitment, that is probably the time that you can slowly begin to increase your ventilatory support. Um, so there are, uh, again, uh, I I am not and this is my personal opinion, I am not a supporter of any type of lung recruitment unless I see some type of response on x-ray or on, um, on uh, blood gases or something that shows with the baseline setting, you're seeing some improvement. With all that said, the other thing that you have to also consider is what the underlying disease process is. So ARDS may be one, but if it's some type of uh, other type of lung injury, um, inhalation injury versus uh, some type of fibrotic injury, that has to also go into your consideration. So uh, I'm sorry, I don't, I can't remember who asked that question, but it's an excellent question. Unfortunately, it's a very uh, uh, difficult uh, question to answer at this point with our knowledge. Thank you, Dr. Mark. It's me that I'm going to ask uh, the question, uh, Dr. Abdelaziz and uh, So the second part of the question, uh, actually, uh, I know maybe it's difficult. If there's any difference in recruitment, if we make a decision for recruitment uh, between the new neonate and children, Sorry, so uh, uh, the recruitment, um, the recruitment for the timing of recruitment, my, my answer would be the same. On neonates, I, I just wait. I wait to see some uh, improvement on, uh, you know, uh, on the x-ray or if I see some spontaneous increase in oxygenation uh, because, you know, we're giving the ventilator 30% oxygen and all of a sudden we see increases in the saturations or PaO2, then, you know, that, that gives me some in indication. But the method at which I uh, recruit uh, is very gentle. So, you know, I, I, you know, do I go back up to a normal volume delivery? No, it's, uh, I probably use a little uh, pressure and to see, and I, when I say this, I use a very, or I, or I use a small volume to see what type of, uh, of, of, uh, pressures uh, are required to generate that volume. But again, um, I don't push it open. And do I do like PEEP? You know, some people do recruitment uh, maneuvers of increasing high PEEP for a short period of time. I, I, I personally do not do that. Kristen, um, what do you do? I would, I would agree with all of those things, Mark. Um, again, when we get to the point where we have some aeration and some uh, improvement in ventilation and oxygenation through the native lung, we will increase the volume very slowly by maybe one per kilo um, every 12 or 24 hours and monitor the pressure response. Um, as far as doing um, recruitment maneuvers, formal recruitment maneuvers with high PEEP in pediatric patients that has been shown to be injurious to lungs. Um, and increase their fibrotic response. So we again don't recommend doing that. For the end of the ECMO run in the same time frame that you're considering increasing your ventilator support, we may also add more in the way of pulmonary hygiene and pulmonary clearance, um, just as we are trying to transition from ECMO to full ventilator support. Okay, thank you, Dr. Christine and Dr. Mark. Uh, uh, you're answering uh, challenging question, uh, and I think you're answering this very well. Uh, we can take one uh, question from the audience before we go for the third speaker. Maybe we'll choose uh, Dr. Mohammed Mushabab. He's raising his hand since a long time. Dr. Mohammed, let's unmute yourself. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. Thank you all for this uh, valuable uh, lecture. Uh, I am a respiratory therapist, a clinical instructor, and Prince Sultan Cardiac Center. 
So uh, as uh, what we are practicing in our uh, pediatric uh, patient in ICUs and infant, uh, especially before ECMO as a method of recruitment, as uh, my colleagues, uh, they add uh, more variable points. It's just to clarify that uh, we, uh, we usually uh, uh, shifting the patient as a practice to uh, pressure control modes. And then we go with the if it adult maximum up to 40 PEEP for like 40 seconds. And of course, we should monitor the patient vital signs and clearly that the patient is stable, not compromising his vital signs. And for the baby, sometimes we go 10 over 10 seconds with also zero rate and with pressure control mode. And uh, for sure, this practice, it could be better that it would be done before connect the patient in ECMO as a trials together with the pronic position. If it will not help before ECMO, it means it's, mean it's uh, still not that really giving us a good outcome in ECMO patient, regardless of either VV mode or uh, arterial venous mode. This is the only thing that I need to add. Otherwise, everything was clarified very well. Can I just add yes, something? Yes. So, uh, you are spot on. I'm so excited with what you just said because I want people, we, we are in a new phase of pediatric ECMO. You, you're, we're not where we were 10 or 20, I mean, let's just say 20 or 15 years ago. We've learned so much with the new technology and a lot of the adult data. So Nana showed one paper, right? That paper, the proning paper. I want people to be very careful with that paper because it was written in 2005. That's right. 20 years ago. And what we've learned about proning and what we've learned about pulmonary toilet, what we've learned about ventilator strategies has really changed. So we have to be open to, to trying these techniques again uh, to improve our outcomes, right? And so uh, just the one thing I, I always think about is remember adult ECMO was completely shut down because of one NIH paper that was really in hindsight horrible, but that was old, old data. And we learned from that paper for the 20 years and now look at adult ECMO. And I, I wanna say the same thing about pediatric ECMO. People did do studies 15, 20 years ago, but look at it, learn from it, but don't depend on making your decisions based on that because we've come so far in our knowledge in yes. pulmonary management. Agreed, yes, yes, that's right. Okay, thank you, Dr. Uh, Mark, uh, for your valid uh, uh, or complete uh, answer. Uh, I think for the time, uh, we, uh, we need to go for the third uh, talk today, and then we can make uh, all the question at the end. Uh, Dr. Sosan can introduce uh, our uh, speaker. Go ahead, Dr. Sosan. I'm introducing my dear Christine. Thanks so much, uh, Dr. Carol. Uh, and uh, the, uh, the mic is yours to present for us the challenges uh, on ECMO at the clinical program uh, side. Uh, we are so excited and waiting for your talk. Great, thank you very much, Dr. Nada. Are my slides there? Yes, clear, but you can... Uh, perhaps present them as a full screen. Christy, you may have to take it out of presenter's view. Look yeah. at your monitors on, up front on the top. Second to the last section on the right. Second to the last section on the right. Keep the, see where it says monitors. Go one more over right there. Go below says use presenters view. Unclick that and you'll be good. Sorry, Mark, I don't see what you're talking about. Okay, Christine, just go uh, bring the arrow down, very mm -hmm. down between, between minimizing and making the slide large. The small squares down. Small square. At, 
at the very bottom. Ah, I see. To the right side. The other one. Next to it. This one here? No, to the right side. <laughs> one more. Yeah. Try that. Clicking on that and it doesn't seem to be changing in my view. Is it changing on yours? Uh, no, not yet. Hmm. Okay. Resume slideshow. Hmm. Still in um, presenter mode for you? Yeah. No, but you could, you could probably just to save time, you could probably just go ahead and give, just uh, lower your, there you go, and lower your notes section. Yeah. And you, you can just go, there Perfect. you go. Perfect. All right. Well, sorry for that delay, everyone. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Nada, for inviting me to come talk with you today. This is uh, truly a pleasure. I'm going to talk about challenges in pediatric respiratory ECMO, both a clinical piece and an administrative piece. I have no disclosures for this talk. So as I mentioned, I'm gonna break this into two pieces. First, some of the clinical challenges that we see in pediatric VV ECMO. Um, that I'll include kind of starting from the beginning after patient selection. We'll talk about cannula selection and management, complications we see on VV ECMO, when to convert to VA ECMO, and then prolonged recovery time, um, challenges and exit strategies that we can use for these patients on VV ECMO. <clears throat> We'll also take a look at some administrative challenges, including maintaining competency in a low volume, high acuity care setting like VV ECMO is. We'll look at some cost considerations and how to grow a pediatric respiratory program. So thank you to Dr. Safi for such a wonderful talk on patient selection. Um, once we've selected our patient for pediatric respiratory ECMO, we need to think about cannulation strategy for them. This is one of the most challenging aspects of getting a patient safely on ECMO. We have, in general, three modes of cannulation for VV. The first is a bicable approach, where, as we see in this picture here, we have the cannula coming in typically through the IJ, through the SVC, through the right atrium, and into the IVC. So we have two drainage ports, one in the IVC and one in the SVC, and a reinfusion port in the right atrium directed toward the tricuspid valve. The cannula in the market for pediatric patients is known as the Avalon. The second option is a double lumen right atrial cannula. It's relatively new to the market produced by um, the company Crescent and is currently available in the US and I expect will be available across the world in the coming months to years. Um, and what that cannula is also inserted through the IJ into the SVC, but instead of traversing the right atrium and going into the IVC, it ends, the distal tip ends in the mid right atrium. So again, has two drainage ports, SVC and right atrium, and reinfuses into the right atrium at the level of the tricuspid valve. This cannula um, is believed to be a bit safer and has been long awaited, especially for smaller sized patients as we have seen some uh, cardiac perforations with the Avalon cannula in small patients, particularly neonates. And then the final cannulation strategy is a two-site VV approach. This is where one might take um, the, a cannula placed in the SVC as well as an ephemeral vein and draw from the femoral cannula or from the uh, IJ cannula and return to the other. This strategy tends to have a bit more recirculation than our double lumen cannulas. And so each comes with a, a benefit and a risk. We also have to think about um, imaging modalities that are available. In order to place these cannulas safely, we may need a variety of things like fluoroscopy, echocardiography, chest X-ray, and depending on our institution and what's available, it may alter the cannula that we select for our patients. The patient's pathophysiology is important when selecting a cannula. That is, for example, in a patient with air leak syndrome, it may be very difficult to visualize the placement of an Avalon cannula 
with echocardiography because of air interfering with our images. So we may choose a two-site VV approach for a patient with air leak syndrome. Whereas for asthma, without air leak, an Avalon cannula may be an excellent choice, a bicapal cannula. <clears throat> and finally, the patient characteristics are important. The size of the vessel that's available based on the patient's age and uh, weight. And then also, I would argue that the patient's height likely plays a role in which cannulas will be safe for them as well. So in this next slide, I have a standard image of the Avalon cannula, this bicable cannula. And I wanna point out that there are sizes over here from 13 French all the way to 31 French, so neonates to adults. And um, the distance between the ports becomes very important in our smaller patient population. So if we look at this column here, F that's in purple, this tells us the distance between the cannula's reinfusion port and the distal tip of the cannula. You can see for 20 French for the cannula size and above, that length between the reinfusion port and the distal tip is the same for every cannula. This covers a span of patients somewhere around 15 kilos all the way to adult size. So you can imagine that the real distance between the tricuspid valve and the intrahepatic IVC between a 15 kilo patient and a 70 kilo patient is very different and affects your flow characteristics with this cannula. Likewise, with a 13 French cannula for neonatal patients, the distance between the reinfusion port and the distal tip is only 2.8 centimeters. It's a very short distance. And with that very short distance between the reinfusion port and the intrahepatic IVC distal tip, there is a significant risk of that cannula coming back into the right atrium and potentially creating a perforation. So lots of things at play as we choose our cannulas, but one of them certainly becomes um, complication risk. So once a cannula is in, we have a couple of things that we need to do differently with a VV cannula that we may not do with our VA ECMO cannulation strategy. The position of the VV cannulas places our patients at an increased risk for cardiac perforation. As I mentioned, Giles Peak had a few reports of cardiac perforation in the uh, early 2010s with the Avalon cannula, which heightened everyone's awareness around that in neonatal patients. So many centers have adopted a number of strategies to maintain the adequate and uh, correct position of these cannulas by using fluoroscopy for initial cannulation. And it's important to note that when placing the Avalon cannula, the SVC and the IVC position in pediatric patients is not a straight line. <clears throat> they are offset. And so utilizing fluoroscopy appears to be one of the safer mechanisms for ensuring that your wire is down into the IVC and in the correct position when um, initially cannulating the patient to prevent a right atrial perforation. Many institutions, I think all of us, utilize daily chest x-rays for cannula position. And along with that, being extra conscientious about the fact that as the lung volumes change in our pediatric patients or their fluid status changes, we may see relative shifting of the cannula position. And we need to ensure that that cannula is not retracting back into the right atrium. Our third mechanism for reducing the risk of cardiac perforation and managing the cannula is performing echocardiogram. Many centers do this routinely, um, depending on the type of cannula, but it can be another uh, excellent adjunct to ensure that the cannula is in the correct position. And then lastly, the the way, uh, less way to manage the cannula and make sure that it's in the correct position is by utilizing a lot of patient safety protocols. So every institution um, that performs airway clearance may choose to have certain types of airway clearance or pulmonary hygiene that they will perform or will not perform based on the size of the patient and the cannula that's in, that's in that patient. 
Um, all patients need to be turned at some points to offload their skin to prevent pressure injury. And in doing that, we have a risk of that cannula moving. So again, it goes back to the daily chest X-ray and echocardiogram to ensure that uh, the cannula has not caused an injury. And then uh, finally, with the movement toward awake uh, ECMO and spontaneous movement, we have to be conscientious about the potential for these VV cannulas to move and create an injury. So many institutions have um, teams of folks trained to detect problems with the cannula as the patients move around, like physical therapists and occupational therapists. So the most dreaded complication for anyone on VV ECMO support is reflected by the idea that there is no cardiac support provided for pediatric respiratory ECMO by VV ECMO. So if a patient experiences hemodynamic instability, the resuscitation of that patient proceeds in a relatively standard way as though they were not on ECMO. That is to say that if the patient experiences shock, we assess and treat for the usual causes of shock, including distributive, anaphylactic, hemorrhagic, et cetera. If the patient develops an arrhythmia, we have to medically manage that as with any other patient not on ECMO. And if our treatment, if the arrhythmia is refractory to our treatment, that is when we may consider conversion to VA ECMO for cardiac support. <clears throat> and finally, in the worst of those scenarios, if the patient experiences a cardiac arrest, CPR would progress um, as you normally would for a patient not on ECMO. And one could consider the use of eCPR to support that patient. So getting into some of the specific complications for patients with VV ECMO support. Um, this is a table pulled from the ELSO registries, uh, ELSO registry from 2010 to present and shows the unadjusted rate for pediatric respiratory ECMO complications. On the left-hand side, you'll see the complications in descending order and some of the examples are positioned there on the right. So renal complications, are the most common at 26%, followed by mechanical complications, including circuit thrombosis, cannula problems, circuit changes, and oxygenated failure. Hemorrhagic, metabolic, and pulmonary complications follow, with limb ischemia being very uncommon, given that we don't have an arterial connection on VVM. So for renal replacement therapy, to talk about each of the complications in a little bit more detail, um, for renal replacement therapy, it's likely that the way that this is reported in the ELSO registry reflects the concept that we've identified children with fluid overload on ECMO have a significant increase in mortality. So many centers are utilizing CRT or renal replacement therapies much earlier than we used to as a protective mechanism. For mechanical complications, we talked a lot about right atrial perforation already. This section also includes cannula malpositions and VV ECMO cannulas can be malpositioned in a number of ways. One is in the hepatic vein. Another is up high in the SVC. A third is in the right atrium, but in contact with the right atrial wall or in contact with the tricuspid valve and also a rotational malposition that may lead to things like recirculation. So as Dr. Nada mentioned, there are a few common causes of recirculation, including cannula malposition, fluid status of the patient, typically hypovolemia, cardiac dysfunction, and excessive ECMO pump speed. And I just wanted to direct you all to this paper here uh, by Daryl Abrams and Dan Brody, the identification man and management of recirculation on VV ECMO, I find very helpful as well. Our uh, other complications include hemorrhagic, which mostly represent hemolysis and surgical site bleeding, and CNS injury, which thankfully has a lower risk on VV ECMO than on VA ECMO in pediatric patients. So if we have complications and we're considering conversion to VA ECMO, I wanted to share a little bit about how we think through that process. The conversion to VA ECMO should be considered anytime we have significant hemodynamic instability in the setting of uncomplicated VV ECMO support. 
meaning all things are running well with the VV ECMO circuit, our patient is oxygenating and ventilating, but yet we have hemodynamic instability. <clears throat> Some relatively common reasons for that are pleural or pericardial effusions, cannula malposition, fluid status of the patient, new cardiac dysfunction, and uh, evidence of new infection. So before we make the conversion from VV to VA, it's important to rule all of these things out as quickly as we can, because many of them can be addressed. For example, pleural effusions limiting ECMO flow can be drained with chest tubes. So the reason to really convert to VA ECMO then is that you have hemodynamic instability in the setting of uncorrectable complicated VV ECMO support. So for example, you've placed the pleural drains, but they're inadequate to allow at normal VV ECMO flow, and you have signs and evidence of obstructive shock remaining. Okay. So the <laughs> Dr. Nada asked me to talk a little bit about prolonged recovery time. And this is one of the most challenging aspects of ECMO care, especially respiratory ECMO care across the world. The, I encourage anyone putting a patient on VV ECMO support to consider the end point of their ECMO prior to initiation of the therapy. And what I mean by that is utilizing the framework that Dr. Safi mentioned earlier. ECMO serves as a bridge to something else, whether that's diagnosis, intervention, recovery, or decision. And if it's going to be a recovery, we need to know what that recovery looks like. In general, the longer the need for ECMO support, um, the, the higher the association with lower survival. And I would point you to a paper here by Tom Brogan um, back in 2012 that suggests a relatively close correlation between the duration of ECMO support and um, increased mortality, notably around 30 days of ECMO support having an inflection point of increased mortality. So other things to consider for prolonged recovery time are the specific pathophysiologies that our patients are experiencing and what we would expect to be a normal recovery time. For example, in asthma for VV ECMO support, we would expect our patient to only be on a few days, usually three to five days for the bronchospasm to break and then the patient to be able to ventilate normally. <clears throat> in air leak syndrome, because there's been injury at the alveolar or bronchial level, the lungs need to be de-recruited in order to heal. And that process usually takes five to seven days, sometimes up to 10. And then the lungs need to be allowed to gently reinflate, and that takes another few days. So commonly in air leak syndrome, we support patients for somewhere around seven to 14 days without additional complicating factors. When we get into things like pediatric respiratory distress syndrome and necrotizing pneumonia, we see a lot more variability in the expected recovery time. For example, in aspiration and viral pneumonias, there's better survival overall than bacterial pneumonia. And then for patients who have um, complicated cards, for example, with sepsis, they also have lower survival rates of 40% pertussis as an inciting event for ARDS has a lower survival rate, along with fungal infections and pneumocystis. No matter what way we look at it, the long-term survival is highly dependent on comorbidities, and comorbidities tend to increase with the time on ECMO. For example, multi-system system organ dysfunction carries with it a very poor prognosis. Instead of 72% survival for pediatric respiratory patients without multi-organ dys dysfunction syndrome. Those children with multi-organ dysfunction syndrome have a survival rate closer to 57%. So with knowing our patient's pathophysiology, when do we decide to redirect care and consider our ECMO support to no longer be effective? Well, we would assess that pathophysiology and disease state, look at the comorbidities and disease specific complications and then assess the complications that the patient has experienced on the ECMO. If they're having trouble with clotting or if they have an intraparenchymal hemorrhage, these would maybe reasons that we need to say that their ECMO support has failed and we need to move on. 
additionally, if we've exhausted all of our treatments and we no longer have anything to offer for a treatment, that may be a time that prolonged recovery time is now we know is ineffective. And we've seen that in cases of, for example, Wagner's granulomatosis, where children have received their steroids and IVIG, plasma exchange, and we've exhausted all of our options. And um, unfortunately, their lungs still fail to recover. And then the last piece is the consideration of family values. So if we are going to have, whether it's a short or prolonged course, we're going to need to have some sort of exit strategy to our VV ECMO support. Our hope is always that that will be recovery. And as we talked a little bit about in the last Q&A for 10, the 10 minute session, that is uh, recovery is usually evidenced by improving aeration on the chest X-ray that precedes functioning lung parenchyma. We suggest a trial off when tidal volumes are somewhere around five to six per kilo. The driving pressure is less than 15 or 16 and peak pressures are less than 28 with those volumes. <clears throat> the goal would be to wean the sweep gas off and maintain ECMO pump flow. There are a number of different ways to wean sweep gas. And um, perhaps we can talk about that in the Q&A session in the interest of time. But that uh, duration of the trial off is dependent on multiple factors and can last anywhere from two to 24 hours in the most common cases of VV ECMO support. In general, the longer time the patient was on ECMO support, the longer time they need a trial off without decannulation. We also will assess the lung function and the fragility of the lung parenchyma, making sure that there's no evidence of pulmonary hemorrhage or ongoing injury as we've increased the ventilator settings. And then finally, that is to be weighed against the risk of ECMO-induced complications. So again, if you have a patient who's having challenges with bleeding or clotting, we may shorten the, the trial off in order to prevent ECMO-induced injury. But no matter how long we do a trial off, the goal or the, the process is to obtain serial blood gases and prove the consistency of oxygenation and ventilation. Um, we wanna see no trends in increasing hypercarbia or desaturation over the course of that trial. And unfortunately, if we've determined that our ECMO support is no longer beneficial and the patient is not going to recover, there are a few things that we like we like to think about and make sure that we have ruled out before we determine cessation of ECMO. First, if the ECMO course exceeds the expected time for recovery, given the underlying disease pathology, that's obviously concerning and maybe a reason we need to stop our ECMO support. In that decision-making, we always evaluate for missed diagnoses. So we will typically do a bronchoscopy with a bronchoalveolar lavage to rule out any unidentified or untreated infections, perform a chest CT with contrast to rule out focal infection, necrosis that could be surgically managed, anatomical variants we may have missed, and assess the amount of potential viable lung tissue. And then finally, if we are seeing a refractory infection present in the lungs, we may consider immunology and or genetic testing to see if the patient has an underlying disorder that is um, not treatable. And then the last consideration should be that of lung transplant candidacy that is discussed by a multidisciplinary team. And um, ECMO support would then only be removed if the patient is determined not to be a lung transplant candidate. Okay, so that covers some of the many clinical challenges in VV ECMO support. From there, I'm gonna move on for just a few minutes to the administrative challenges of running and growing um, the um, VV ECMO program. So the first point in um, starting up or really engaging in a VV ECMO program is the concept of the team structure. So with any ECMO program, we know that ECMO is a team sport and um, there is, I'm so sorry, guys. Am I hearing that the slides are not moving? They're moving, Kristen. Oh, okay, thank you. Okay, thanks, Dr. Nada. 
Um, sorry, so in, comp in competency, um, we all know that ECMO is a team sport. And in order to maintain competency and learn, we need to have a robust team structure. So many programs utilize an ECMO coordinator or lead perfusionist who's responsible for training the team members to manage the pump at the bedside, whether that's a perfusionist at the bedside or an ECMO specialist. There's often a physician leader who assists the intensivists in maintaining evidence-based ECMO practice at the bedside and will help with developing institution guidelines and protocols for ECMO care, including anticoagulation, sedation, airway clearance, and many others. And then there's often a cannulation leader. So in the US, that's typically a surgeon, but in many other places, that may be an intensivist who cannulates larger children. But no matter who that person is, their job is to ensure clinical competency of anyone performing cannulations in the institution. And the backbone of that team is always education. So there are many modalities to getting education to grow the VV ECMO program at any one center. Uh, the first is participation in an international ECMO society like ELSO. We can also utilize didactics for internal team topic reviews and ideally scale that to the level of the learner. Journal article reviews internally are always helpful, but none of these didactic education models can uh, compete with the value of simulation. It is by far the most effective strategy for training and maintaining competency in a pediatric respiratory ECMO program. <clears throat> Again, when using simulation, the cases should be scaled to the challenges and um, learning level of any given learner. The cases should include things like cannulation, routine care, complications, and decannulation. And then from a director standpoint, should be used as a benchmark of team performance, including the accuracy of actions in simulation, as well as the time required to perform tasks, assemble the team, and perform life-saving maneuvers. And then finally, uh, in order to maintain competency, credentialing has to be documented for all levels of um, ECMO team participants. So uh, with that, you may choose to have varying levels of ECMO credentials, depending on what the function of each bedside provider is. So in our institution, we have a staff intensivist credentialing process, an ECMO physician leader um, credentialing process, and a cannulation clinician uh, credentialing process as well. For cost considerations of ECMO, obviously this is a very expensive modality. So the, the most uh, we can do as far as careful resource allocation goes is ensure that we're choosing the best ECMO candidates until we get the most benefit from the program to the patients. We need to limit equipment use. So I highly recommend using a single console, pump, oxygenator, if possible, to reduce waste and training on varied equipment. Specific to VV ECMO programs, obviously there's a little bit of different equipment with the VV ECMO cannulas but also there may be different um, imaging needs. Like we talked about earlier with the Avalon cannula being um, placed under fluoroscopy in many institutions and may need to um, increase the capacity of echocardiography. In order to maintain the program, there needs to be ongoing training. So that may, be, that may mean paying staff in order to participate in didactics, simulation time, and extra bedside care of ECMO patients and then maintenance of equipment. Um, obviously there needs to be an emergency circuit primed that may be wasted from time to time. In addition to fluctuations in product availability on the market, there is a limited number of suppliers of pediatric equipment and sometimes those products are unavailable. So consider having a financial reserve for emergency purchases. And then finally, I recommend one way to pare down cost is to perform research utilizing expired equipment rather than throw it away, um, use it as a bench talk resource. And finally, in order to grow a program, obviously we need to recruit patients. And one of the most effective tools we've found is performing outreach to other centers. We recommend um, having an option for outside hospital, hospitals to consult you 
um, with the potential for an ECMO need, but in a time frame that allows for early transport before the patient actually requires ECMO. And then as time goes on and the program grows and has good outcomes, you can expand ECMO candidacy to the higher risk patients that Dr. Nada and Dr. Safi talked about earlier with patients like oncology patients. Quality and continuous improvement are essential for growing a program. There, is, um, there are a variety of ways to perform benchmarking to ensure that your institution is performing at the level you would like it to. You can do that internally or through programs like Arbor Metrics through ELSO, and it takes a team to do that. For anyone not familiar with Arbor Metrics, I just wanted to share a little bit about it. It's a program run through ELSO, so any ELSO center sites um, are able to access this. What it allows you to do is filter your data for your patients against the um, ELSO registry. So for example, in this report, I just ran mortality reports for pediatric patients on VV ECMO in our hospital. So down here, and we can compare our outcomes at our center to the overall ELSO registry. But even more granular than that, programs like Arbor Metrics allow us to assess individual complication rates. So again, you can filter your center for pediatric or adult, pulmonary or cardiac, VV or VA patients, and compare your outcomes in any complication rate to the ELSO registry. It's a very powerful tool to ensure we're doing the best for our patients. Along with benchmarking quality improvement um, comes patient safety. And so we recommend continual case reviews with internal and external experts and a review of any acute events immediately through apparent cause analysis or root cause analysis. And um, ongoing research will um, certainly ensure or improve safety inside your own program and help it to grow. That can be through multi-site or local research, clinical and benchtop, and a number of database options through ELSO. And then finally, networking helps our programs grow, um, both in skill set and, um, and knowledge, right? So there are lots of opportunities for committee membership and multi-site research through ELSO that helps our um, knowledge base so we feel confident expanding our ECMO services to more complicated patients along the way. My apologies for running over time a little bit. Um, here's my contact information if anyone has any questions, but I understand there will be a Q&A now as well. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Carol. It's really, really, really nice presentation. We enjoyed it. Okay, let's open the floor for questions. Uh, can we uh, uh, unmute uh, the one who is raising their hands? We have a Zoom user. Uh, do you have the question? I think Dr. Anas, uh, you had asked a question in the beginning. You still, your hand is raising. You still have a question or no? Okay. Meanwhile, uh, uh, there is a question from our colleague, in, uh, Dr. Tariq al -Ayed. He's asking about uh, what's your role strategy of weaning VA ECMO for respiratory disease in a patient who was unable to insert VV ECMO cannula. Do you go with a sweep gas or flow weaning? So if we have the answer from Dr. Mark or uh, Dr. Carol. Kristen, I'll, I'll let you answer that one since you talked about weaning. Sure. Um, so, if the patient's cardiac function is normal, which we would presume if we're weaning, we are, then um, my recommendation is to wean the sweep gas. Um, the reason for this is that I can get a much better sense of the patient's native ability to oxygenate and ventilate by weaning individual components of the sweep gas. That is, I can verify oxygenation by reducing the FSO2 or the, the oxygen, a fraction of oxygen on the sweep gas. And then I can lower 
the flow of the sweep gas to assess their ventilation improvement. Um, the other benefit of weaning the sweep gas over weaning the flow is that you can maintain the integrity of the circuit better and develop fewer thrombi. So Kristen, that's, that's for VA ECMO? Yeah. So can, can I just ask you a, the, the next question mm -hmm. is um, if you're just weaning the sweep, so that's you're really targeting the uh, respiratory component of the support on VA ECMO, how, how, if you're still at full flows, you're still providing some cardiac support. Do, are you, do you test the heart sometime in your run to make sure that the heart truly is okay to come off of ECMO on VA? Because, you know, a lot of times on VA, on these respiratory kids, the RV does take a hit. Or, um, so, you know, do you just depend on, because it's tough to do an echo on VA, I mean, uh, echocardiogram on VA ECMO because you don't get a true sense of the cardiac function due to the afterload you're introducing into the system? Sure, that's a great question, Mark. So um, in my experience, I will run their flow overall lower than I would run a cardiac patient. So for example, maybe 80 to 100 per kilo of flow, which is still a decent amount of cardiac support. But yes, toward the end of the run, when my sweep gas is down and looking like we may be recruiting and developing native lung function, we will wean and perform, still perform echoes um, in a flow weaning phase, usually within the 24 hours or so, 24 to 48 hours before we're expecting to decannulate. So for example, we would do an echo on half flow. And then if that looked good, the RV was still functioning well, then we would do a full clamping trial after that. And how do you do a clamping trial if you don't have, I mean, you lose all your flow through your catheters. So how do you, how do you maintain patency of the catheters if you're clamping off? Sure. Um, so we will clamp off uh, the catheters and we'll perform what's commonly known as flashing. So every five to 10 minutes, uh, we will reopen the catheters by releasing the clamps to allow a few seconds of flow to ensure that they don't clap. It used to be that the standard um, was 10 minutes between flashing to ensure patency of the cannulas. Um, however, we have anecdotally noticed that sometimes we see plasma separating at closer to five minutes. And so if we see that plasma separation, we do perform the flash sooner. Very interesting. Um, uh, I have uh, you allow me a question uh, to the whole team. Uh, did you face like um, a family resistance when you try to shift the patient back or decannulate him and shift him back to ventilation as a hopeless case? Or let, let's say that he did not benefit from ECMO and you decided that's it, that's over game is over and you decide to put him back on conventional ventilation. Do you face an, uh, a family resistance uh, in this uh, situation? That's a wonderful question. Um, so the overarching answer is yes, of course, families become sad if we um, explain that we are limited in what else we can do for their child meaning there are no other therapies to try because ECMO is really just giving us time. That being said, we do have a few things we do to try to mitigate that. So the first is when we consent a family for ECMO, we specifically discuss the reasons we may need to stop or remove ECMO support. And we include that in that conversation, the potential for ECMO to cause harm so if at any point in time ECMO is creating a complication, then that is the medical team's decision and right to take that ECMO support away because it's causing active harm to their child. We also do explain that at times 
you don't have any more therapeutic options. And so ECMO just is uh, prolonging the, the course of death. And we say those things up front to the parents. Of course, in distress when their child is critically ill, um, no family fully hears that. So we also engage our palliative care team um, from the very beginning of every ECMO patient's run. And that allows them to develop a therapeutic relationship with the palliative care team and work with the medical team um, to have conversations virtually daily about how their child is doing and if we're making any strides and headway. So rarely does it come as a full surprise to our families when we do say that we need to take away ECMO because it's no longer helpful. That's really very nice. Uh, we, we also have uh, similar problems, but sometimes the parents, they, they really resist and give us a hard time. Uh, and sometimes we need to extend the ECMO just to confirm for them that nothing can be added and we might harm the patient more. So we stop against uh, them and uh, they will raise, raise a complaint, unfortunately. Mm. Yeah, you know, I think there's cultural differences between the United States and um, your your uh, the, your in your region. Um, so I, you know, we have to be sensitive to some of the beliefs. But uh, I I do have to say, even in the United States, um, we do have parents that are completely adamant um, in their religious beliefs that we do not that they, they cannot um, uh, uh, agree to uh, stopping um, ECMO support. So it, it does become uh, difficult at times. Uh, and it's, uh, yes, sometimes we do have to prolong it, but there is a process. Uh, but uh, I think in one of the things that we are very, I know our program does is that we are very clear with the parents about our um, about the destination. You know, as a destination to recovery, destination to transplant, and de definitely we don't use these terms, but a destination to nowhere, right? So uh, we try to mitigate the conflict that can occur, but there will always be families who do not hear or do not want wish to hear. Uh, this option for their child. So, uh, I, you know, I, it's a very, very uh, excellent topic to discuss. Um, I, and I, I, I'm sorry, but I do not e even know uh, if you have uh, services similar to our palliative care, but we have found that to be extremely helpful. And I, I you know, uh, maybe this is uh, available in your kingdom, but uh, I, I, I apologize for not knowing. Thanks so much, Mark, for your uh, feedback and Christine, uh, that was wonderful. Uh, I would uh, love to ask one question that is a challenge from my uh, position. How or what's the best strategy to sustain all of what you have mentioned, Christine, in the program from education to the quality, to the data collection, to to the patient management, to keep up the momentum with the team, family, and all of that in a context of limited resources places. Especially when it comes into either we keep going with what we have and we strain our uh, resources or we stop doing it. So what is your thoughts about it? And what's your recommendations to overcome these challenges? I know it's very huge, but. That is a huge one. Um, that's a great question, though. And I think even inside the United States, we have varying levels of um, hospitals' ability to support programs like this. So we probably see this on a different scale, but to some degree, the same concept. I think the most important part is having a team as much as that's possible. So having someone who is engaged and interested in quality improvement and patient safety to be benchmarking and to be looking at these things. Um, someone who is available to help the intensivist team, whether that just be by phone or in person, but um, it takes a team of people to do that. 
And um, I think that's, that's probably the most important part. When it comes to costs and the sort of financial administrative pieces of things, I think that is transitioning from just a VA ECMO program to a combination of VA and VV ECMO program really doesn't have a huge financial impact on the institution. It's mostly a few extra pieces of equipment and some element of imaging changes. Um, but I think as far as the personnel side, I think that's where we see the most challenge. And it's a matter of finding folks who are interested and engaged and willing to help you, um, as well as making those international and national contacts. Mark, do you have more thoughts on that, knowing the region better? Um, it's uh, first uh, to sustain a program. I, you know, there's been many excellent points brought up. Uh, you know, I, I would say at the stage that pediatric and neonatal ECMO is in 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 Saudi, um, we the important piece is to be. It, uh, selective in your patients. Uh, I think even though you would like to put every patient on that has potentially any chance of surviving, ha, does not have chance of surviving without ECMO may not be the best way to start. It is extremely important that you in the first beginning is that you develop confidence in your teams. So confidence means having some selecting the appropriate patients and uh, making sh doing what you can't know selecting the appropriate patients so that the outcome is the best possible uh, for for the patients. Um, I think that is a major imp very important psychological barrier that has to be ingrained in your teams is just the confidence to do um, this new, procedure to um, save uh, kids' lives. Um, that is, I think, first point. The second point is that also saves on resources, right? Because you you are, um, you know, if you do a 200-day run on a patient that has multi-organ failure and that patient ends up dying, that's a tremendous amount of resources that, that we can talk about it from the financial perspective, but it also is a tremendous drain on your on the emotional resources of your team. So again, patient selections becomes becomes extremely important in the initial phase of of the um, uh, of the program. Everything I would say in developing a pediatric program should be done carefully in phases. One is when you first start out, single organ failure, very well defined. Um, Dr. Safi uh, described some, you know, very, uh, uh, I think, some excellent uh, uh, selection criteria that, you know, you're, you're, you're defining who you're putting on. And as you develop success and more confidence, that's when you go to phase two and um, sort of uh, uh, expand the type of patients you're accepting because your team is, a little, uh, is more comfortable in dealing with uh, some of the challenges on uh, two organ system or three organ system patients. Now, I'm not really answering your question, Nada, but the thing is, uh, there there are many factors that go into a successful uh, build of a pediatric uh, team, but uh, it, it comes down really to the people that make up the team, because it's the people that make up the team that will carry. Uh, carry you through the great moments, but it's also equally as important that they carry you through some of the challenging moments so that you can continue to build your program. It, it's not always, you know, it's not always flowers. Um, sometimes you do have to uh, work through um, some of the issues, but if you have a team that communicates, collaborates, and supports each other, I think that's how you can continue to to push things forward and to be innovative to uh, meet your challenges. Lots of words, but the bottom line is of what I say with Kristen and her team is that 
they're a family. They are truly a family that takes care of each other. Um, if when we have three deaths in a row, it's traumatic, but they take care of each other and they keep moving forward. So uh, um, I think that is critical for the success of any team. Wonderful. Thanks so much for your inspirations. For anyone who have any question, you can unmute yourself, like Zoom user NS or any of the audience, just for the sake of time. Yeah, I saw that uh, one name iPhone raising his hand. Do you unmute yourself? Go ahead, please. Zoom user. Dr. Anas Faraj. I'm trying to help out with the unmute process. Dr. Abdullah Tayyib. You have a question? Okay, I'm not sure how to go through that. Hello. I think, yes, Dr. Abdullah. Can you hear me, Starek? Yes, tafadal, uh, Dr. First of all, thank you, uh, Nada and your team uh, for this uh, outstanding uh, presentation. I'd like to thank uh, your speakers and moderator and everyone for this nice talk. Um, my questions uh, is number one, uh, I am aware of uh, majority of suggestion that in using higher PIB in patient needing a BV ECMO of PIB of 10. Uh, the question now, patient who had uh, an ARDS with, with an air leak syndrome, uh, probably PIB of 10 might cause more of lung injury and worsening of, of the air leak syndrome. So the question, how far you could go down with your PIB on someone with an ARDS with LX syndrome. This question number one. Second question, what is an outcome uh, of patient has been uh, cannulated or placed in ECMO with sepsis and septic shock, ARDS with septic shock, or purely a septic shock, and what is there an outcome for this patient? And the last question, whom do you think is the best in managing a BV ECMO? Is it more of cardiac ICU team or general pediatric intensive care who have been equipped and have an experience with ECMO? Thank you. These are fantastic questions. Thank you so much for those. <clears throat> um, we'll maybe take them one at a time. So the first question is in air leak syndrome, is a PEEP of 10 or a mean airway pressure just above 10 if we're using uh, bimodal pressures too high? And uh, what PEEP would we go to to reduce the risk of air leak syndrome? What I have found, uh, first of all, there are no papers on this that I am aware of and have looked a number of times. Um, that being said, the vast majority of patients that I've cared for with air leak syndrome actually do very well on a PEEP of 10 with virtually no tidal volume. So in this case of air leak, I will usually use pressure regulated volume control mode of ventilation with a one to two cc per kilo tidal volume, really targeting just the conducting airways and leaving the PEEP at 10. 
Uh, we tend to see full white out of the lungs after that and resolution of the air, usually within three to five days. <clears throat> so that's just one anecdote, but unfortunately there are virtually no papers to provide true evidence-based guidance on that. The second question was on uh, septic shock and outcomes. And I apologize, I, I wasn't sure if the question was VV versus VA support for septic shock or the septic shock outcomes on VV ACMO support. Are we able to clarify that? In general, the outcome of uh, based on the septic shock requiring an ECMO support, either VA or VV, likely okay. VA. Okay. Um, so there are two, two lenses that the literature has shared around septic shock. The first is that um, on VA ECMO support, the overall outcomes for sepsis in pediatric patients are survival rates in the 40 to 50, 55% range, if you, depending on what the organism, the source, the co and the comorbidities are. So um, there was a period of time where we cannulated patients to VA ECMO for sepsis through peripheral cannulation. And we know that in pediatric patients, it's very difficult to achieve enough cardiac output through peripheral VA cannulation in sepsis to improve their outcomes. So there was a shift then towards central cannulation and central cannulation of VA ECMO support for sepsis is still relatively effective and has that um, survival rate of about 50%. The alternative strategy is to use VV ECMO support and vasoactives to support the hemodynamics through the shock phase of their distributive shock. That has also been proven very effective. And so from my vantage point and um, the literature that's available, I look at what the source of our, septic, our sepsis is. If it is primarily a pulmonary pathology, we will often take the approach of using VV ECMO support with vasoactives to get them through the distributive phase of their shock. If it is a bacteremia with many confounding factors like renal injury and hepatic injury, then we often lean toward central VA cannulation in order to um, get enough cardiac output to support all of those organs that are injured. Once you do have multi-organ dysfunction syndrome, however, the survival decreases pretty dramatically. And then I think the third question was, who's best to manage VV ECMO? <laughs> that's a great debate. So I think that's very, um, my vantage point is that that's very institution dependent. So for programs that have only utilized ECMO in the cardiac ICU, I think the collaboration between pediatric intensivists and cardiac intensivists is the best option to house the patient where folks are used to taking care of ECMO with the input from pediatric intensivists on the lung and the care of the lungs. In institutions where um, ECMO has been utilized in the general pediatric intensive care unit, I think the general pediatric intensivists are likely better suited in most institutions to support the recovery of the lungs and understand that pathophysiology. That's really institution dependent. Amazing uh, answers, Christine, and really excited to hear from you um, all of that. Honestly, there is a lot to ask, and uh, I'm sure that we would have lots of uh, uh, entertained uh, questions if it's not 10, uh, after 10.30, I feel like people uh, uh, would be late already. So I will just ask for the last two minutes uh, if we could hear from you, uh, Mark and Kristen, regarding the uh, experience on uh, pulmonary embolism, uh, having them on ECMO as a rescue therapy um, uh, since we had devastating uh, incidental pulmonary embolism led to cardiac arrest, but 
um, the generally speaking ECMO and pulmonary embolism was the question of my colleague. And I would collect the rest of the questions. Perhaps we can arrange for another uh, session um, uh, for the rest of the questions. So if we can answer that, that will be wonderful before the closing remarks. Sure. Mark, would you like to jump in or would you like me to uh, take that one? Uh, you should take that one. <laughs> okay. Um, oh, thanks, Nada. This, um, this is a great question. Um, for pediatric patients with pulmonary embolism, um, assuming that they are not a cardiac patient with shunted physiology and they're a child who has uh, perhaps has cancer or some other reason to have a PE. Um, ECMO is highly, highly effective in rescuing them, just as it is in adult patients. Um, clearly that would be VA ECMO support because if we're talking about a child who's so hemodynamically, um, so clinically unwell, that they need to be rescued from their pulmonary embolism. It's likely a saddle embolus and having grave um, cardiac effects. So that would, we would typically use VA as a rescue for that. Um, and it is um, much like in adults, pulmonary embolism rescue with ECMO is, um, the overall outcome is dependent on the time that the patient is desaturated and experiencing limited pulmonary blood flow. So certainly as I think everyone on this call is aware with limited pulmonary blood flow, the patient's not oxygenating at all. So the faster that can happen, the better the outcome. There is debate in the literature about whether or not to provide patients with pulmonary embolism, TPA or um, other thrombolytics prior to initiating ECMO. And the overall answer for that is still up in the air and unclear about whether that dramatically increases the risk of hemorrhage once on ECMO. We suspect it does, but the, the papers are not perfectly clear on that. So overall, it can provide a rescue, recommended usually VA support for pulmonary embolism. And um, the faster the time on, the better because of the risk of anoxic injury. Once we get to about 30 minutes of CPR or profound hypoxemia, we tend to see an 